It is 7 o'clock, News 12 Long Island would like to join the rest of the nation by clapping because we care. This is our way of saying thank you to all the essential workers out there. Thank you, Donald, from Patchogue. Donald delivers much-needed groceries for Peapod. And to Eric of Patchogue. Eric is an emergency room doctor in Nassau County. Thank you to Zine. To Zine is an anesthesiologist at Stony Brook Hospital. And Nicole of North Babylon, a nursing assistant at Good Samaritan Hospital, graduates from Adelphi next month and will be a full-fledged RN, but already a hero. Thank you, Sal. Sal is a paramedic from Floral Park. And Edward of East Meadow. Edward is a nurse at Mount Sinai South Nassau Hospital. And to you, Sarah, from Plainview, an ER nurse at St. Joseph's Hospital in Bethpage. So are you a nurse, a doctor, grocery store employee, restaurant worker, dry cleaning employee, bus driver, MTA employer, or any other essential worker? We want to hear from you. Send us pictures of the essential workers in your lives. All we need is the picture, the person's name, the village or town, and what the person does for a living. Every night, right here at 7, we will be thanking those people who have been on the front lines during this pandemic. Just go to the News 12 Facebook and Twitter pages. That will show you how to do it. I'm Stone Grissom and welcome to our live coronavirus pandemic special report. Tonight we have a doctor from Glen Cove Hospital to help you sort through what's going on with COVID-19 in our communities and across the region. We want to hear from you. This is a call-in show. So call us at that number right there at the bottom of your screen, 516-393-1800. While there were some harsh words today from Governor Cuomo against caving into political pressure to reopen the economy, he says he understands the economic hardship, but he says he knows more people will die if we're not smart. In response to the reopened protests on Long Island and across the state, he said nothing comes before the public health risk of someone else's life. Now, the key to unpausing New York is testing and tracing. That's what everyone says. The governor announced that former New York City Mayor Mike Bloomberg, he'll be helping the state coordinate a first-of-its-kind tracing program. Bloomberg is also giving more than $10 million to the effort. And new testing sites in some of Long Island's hot spots today. Laura Kern announced the opening of additional testing sites. Those would be in Hempstead and Freeport. And Suffolk Executive Ballone says a new site will open in Quorum. That'll be Friday. Both executives address the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 along ethnic lines. They hope to bring some relief by beefing up testing in those minority areas. And today is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. In honor of the occasion, Suffolk Executive Ballone wants to show the county's gratitude to essential and frontline workers. The county will be planting 50 trees this year to show appreciation for all the workers who risked their lives during this pandemic. And students and alumni from St. Joseph's College are joining in the fight against COVID-19. The students we spoke with, they say they're finishing up school while working on the front lines. They describe the past few weeks as stressful and scary, but they are determined to continue making it work. All right, let's get right to our discussion. Joining us tonight, Dr. John Coletta, Chairman of Emergency Medicine at Glen Cove Hospital. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just say I include you in the clapping. You are obviously on the front lines and we thank you for everything you do every day. Um, so let me start off by asking how are you and your colleagues doing right now? How are you holding up? Uh, well, it's, we're doing doing great. Um, you know, we've had an amazing staff and they've been really arose to the challenge. Um, we're starting to see a little light at the end of the tunnel. We're seeing less, uh, less volume in, in, in the ED, although still the patients that are coming in are, are, are very sick. So um, it, are, are, we seeing, are you seeing the plateau at, at, at the hospital the governor keeps talking about, or maybe the descent? Yeah, I, I think we're on the descent. I mean, I can speak for my, my ER, and uh, our volume is definitely down. Um, and, you know, total numbers of people coming in. Now, there's still pr large percentages of the people that we see are mostly COVID patients, but you know, and, and sick, but there's definitely much, much less. Okay, uh, let's get right to the callers right now. I think we have Ashley from Bayshore. Ashley, you there? Hi, I'm here. Oh, what's your question tonight? Um, I lost the ability to smell and taste, so I just wanted to know, you know, if that was like um, a symptom. Uh, doctor? Yeah, so that, uh, the, the loss of a, a smell and taste is a very common symptom with COVID. 
Uh, the interesting part is that sometimes it happens early, and then I have also now recently been seeing people with it coming on later after they have a fever and it's been going on for a while. Yes, it will go away, so don't worry. Everyone's saying it resolves. Okay, uh, Nancy from Middle Island. Nancy, there. Uh, yes. What's your question tonight? Okay, my question is, uh, if you were tested positive for the COVID-19, how long afterwards would you resume getting your sense of smell and taste back? So the, the smell and taste has been actually longer than you would think. I mean, people can go five, six days still feeling that they, you know, they can't smell or taste anything. And it's been variable, some people less than that. I mean, the one thing about this virus, it's not been so consistent. What happens in one person is maybe having double the time in the, in, in the next. But just hang in there, it will, it will go away. Okay, and I think we have Jessica from Brooklyn. Jessica? Uh, hi, thanks for, thanks for taking my question. I test positive for COVID-19 and I have a baby, a mom baby. So I want to know how safe is to keep breastfeeding the baby or if he get, will get contagious, you know, through breast milk. So they're not sure if it's coming through breast milk. So they haven't proven that the disease is transmitted through that. Um, you know, and again, this is ongoing studies that you, we need to keep looking at with the pregnant population and breastfeeding. I'm sure there are studies going on to see if it even is passed from a pregnant woman to the to the fetus. I'm, I'm right. assuming. I mean, so what? Yeah, that that's what they're looking at. They know that the antibodies will cross um, to the fetus, but they're not they're not. You know, if you if you have it and you you develop the antibodies, but not so sure about the the disease. Yeah, that's that's the problem with this. Is it's so it's so new. It's a novel coronavirus, so that's that's one of the big problems. Um, Carol from Massapequa. Carol, are you there? You'll get to it. Carol, are, are are you on the line, Carol? Carol, can you hear me? Uh, let me see if we have uh, Lid Lidai. Let's try to go to Lidai. Lidai, you there? We either, Carol. It, Hi, this is Carol. Carol, okay. Uh, Thanks for calling. What's your question? So I have uh, two questions. One, it has to do with pregnant mothers. If they have the coronavirus, once they deliver the baby, would the baby have the same antibodies that the mother would have? And the second question is, in trying to uh, reuse PPEs like the face mask, putting the face mask into the microwave oven, would that kill the virus? Okay, those are great questions. Um, first, I'll talk about the, the PPE. Uh, the, all the N95 masks that you buy are really used for single use. I mean, they can last 12 hours, maybe you can get a day out of them. Um, there's been different ways to try, people can try to heat them, and then there was, people would say maybe UV light sterilization. It, it really is not ideal. Um, it's really for a one-time use. Okay. Uh, and as far as uh, transmitting to the baby, uh, to, to to the babies, or um, usually kids will have to go through the immune process, you know, to develop immunity by getting exposed, and then it, it generates their own immune system to to develop antibodies. Again, but this is all on the forefront, and I think they're looking at this very closely. Okay. Uh, I think we have uh, Linda waiting. Linda, you there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, what's your question tonight? Okay, I am allergic to polyester and cotton on the mask. What can I use to go out? So, there, there, you can use just a, a, a cloth mask. Um, there's very nice videos uh, that you can see on YouTube and how to, you know, how to fold them and make them up. I mean, it's not ideal, but if there's an allergy issue with any of the masks, you can always go to a cloth mask. And I think, uh, it, it is, correct me if I'm wrong, is silk a good uh, material to use because it's so tightly woven? You could. You could use a silk uh, bandana type. Okay. Um, and I think we have Laura next. Is that right? All right, that's me. Uh, what's your question tonight? Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon or good evening. Uh, quick concerns the food items. Um, does the virus survive extreme temperatures, say from freezing and or all the way to boiling? 
That's a great question. So uh, as far as what they know now is that they, heating and extreme cold could would kill the, kill the virus. Again, again, and I always preface everything I'm kind of saying is that it, this stuff is all new and it can change at any moment. But yes, it can. Um, it, heating would do that. Okay. Um, I think we have a, is it Lady? Or Ladai, Lady? Lady. Lady, uh, what's your question tonight? Um, yes, I would like to know how long the fever lasts because my father had a fever for five days and then the fever went away for like two days and then it came back and now he has had a fever again for three days. Right, that's a great question. The, uh, what we're seeing is uh, some people, the fever is persisting up to 10 days. And I have seen that frequently. Well, they'll get a fever, and then they think they're on the mend, and then the fever's coming back. Okay. Um, what type of symptoms are you seeing in the ER? I mean, I'm, I'm just now hearing today about this uh, COVID toe, these lesions on people's foot that seems to manifest itself. I mean, what, what, what are you seeing in the ER as far as what symptoms people are coming in with? This, this virus has been changing what it manifests manifestations daily I mean uh, it, it's amazing yeah they have a, been noting that they have these little uh, reddish lesions on the toes um, we have been seeing people come to the emergency room that have really very minimal respiratory symptoms but really abdominal pain and they have you know focal tenderness in their in their abdomen and we work them up and it ends up just being that it's COVID and we're finding that you know people having heart attacks and it's COVID um, people having blood in their urine, that's the newest thing, and, and, and it's COVID. Um, we're also seeing people coming in with uh, renal disease, and it ends up being a symptom of a COVID infection. So what, what is some of the symptoms that would require you to admit somebody at that point? Is it just the shortness of breath that you really need to get under control? Right, so when we um, are seeing people, the lo everyone is coming in and has a cough and a fever, and um, what we're looking for is to see if the oxygen level is low. So you look at, and also when you're evaluating a patient, it's just not only that, it's also their past medical history, if they have heart disease, if they have lung disease. It seems like the disease has a uh, higher incidence in uh, men, Obese, hypertension, hyper, you know, uh, hypertension, and, uh, and and lung disease. Okay. So you, when you put that all together and they have a low oxygen, those are the people that you probably want to keep. Okay. Um, we're going to take a real quick break. We're going to have more expert advice on how to keep you and your family safe from the coronavirus. And remember to call in the number right there at the bottom of your screen. We'll be right back. back to our live coronavirus pandemic special report. Let's bring back in Dr. John Coletta, the chairman of emergency medicine at Glen Cove Hospital. Um, during the break, we had a caller that didn't want to talk on air, but uh, had a question. I'll, I'll just, I'll try to uh, reiterate it. Uh, he wants to know if uh, garbage pickup uh, men are at a higher risk because they're touching so many things and if just wearing gloves would be sufficient for them. So that's a great question. You know, they, they have looked at um, how long the virus lasts on each surface. Cardboard, 24 hours, uh, you know, steel can last up to a couple of days. So as, as long as there's, he has gloves and not touching from his gloves to his face, uh, it's a very low risk. Yeah, very. Okay. Good, good. Uh, I think we have Frank on the line. Frank, you there? Yeah, hi. Um, I had the uh, the flu shot in the in the in the uh, in the fall, uh, the, the fall. Uh, it was the double dose the super one or whatever uh, and uh, but uh, nonetheless I ended up with uh, a lot of symptoms of the corona uh, virus I'm trying to determine uh, I, well I never got tested for uh, corona uh, uh, because I didn't meet all the criteria so I was wondering it was the the, the, the flu shot was the flu shot the seasonal flu uh, shot uh, effective at all because uh, I'm just on my own trying to determine was it the flu that I have or did I have the uh, the coronavirus and I'm just stuck in the middle and uh, I'm, you know if I find out the flu shot was 
it pr pretty much ineffective, okay. like I think it was in the past couple of years. It was only like 50% effective. Okay. Okay. I, I think I think we got I think, I think we got the question. question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's that's a great question. So as you know, the flu symptoms are almost regular traditional seasonal flu that we see. It, it, the symptoms are almost identical to to, to COVID, um, and it, it's impossible to tell. Sometimes it's just by what someone's telling you. So a, as you know, they're, they'll be coming out with viral, uh, I mean, um, uh, bl blood uh, studies to tell you if you've been exposed and ran through the cycle. And that's coming out relatively soon, and you'd be able to tell. So they would draw your blood, and then they would be able to say, yes, you, you were exposed to it, and you have an antibody to it, so you, you went through it. Okay. Um, Jim, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Uh, which question? Okay, I underwent a knee replacement back in September, and I was going to the physical therapist, which inc included the aqua therapy. Uh, the, the sports center is opening up again. Is it safe to go into the pool? There was usually one, the most two people in the pool. The size of the pool was about 8 by 15. Yeah, that's a great question. So trying to open up people uh, to back to their health care providers is, is so important. It, it, maintaining the social distancing of the six feet um, is really what you want to want to do. And of course, masking is always going to be a benefit. So doctor, along those lines, is it the time spent uh, being infected that creates the, uh, the uh, severity of the symptoms? Ah, that's, a, that's another great question. So the, the latest thing they think that why people get worse cases with corona than, uh, than others, you know, we see, so 80% of the people who get corona is mild symptoms and they get through it. Uh, you know, the people, there are a subset of those other 20% of people who unfortunately have to go on ventilators and, and be seriously ill. And so there's been some thought that if you get exposed to a large Inoculum. In other words, uh, if someone coughs in your face and you inhale a lot of uh, a lot of the vi viral particles, you will get a worse case. So it might be almost like a dose dependent of uh, 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 predictor of how 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 you can how bad the infection is going to be. Okay. Uh, super but that's, again, that's all being studied. You know, so it will come out over time. Yeah. All right. Uh, see if we can squeeze in John from Quorum. John. Thank you, Dr. John. I'd like to thank you very much for your fantastic work. It, you and Stone, Stone, you're doing, doing a great job too. Thank you very much. Can this um, virus be transmitted transmit sexually? Is it okay to have sex during this time of the pandemic? So, so there's. It's a great question. There's there, there's no evidence now that we know of that it's going to be sexually transmitted, and I, I, I'll preface it again and say that that's not. You know, maybe there's going to be more studies upon this, and and, and I think up to date now that they're not entirely sure. Okay. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time that we're going to have tonight. I want to thank you again, uh, Dr. Coletta, for all the work that you do. You guys are really the heroes for everyone, and I. I really appreciate uh, everything you do. So if there's anything you guys need, just contact the News 12 and we'll try to get the word out and as much as uh, help as we can give. Great, thank you so much. All right, and thank you to you, for our viewers, for your questions. And don't forget, tomorrow night at seven o'clock, we'll be right back here. So we'll see you then.